Dobré ráno, dámy a pánové. Dovolte mi, abych vás srdečně přivítal jménem společnosti Emark na takovém formátu, který jsme nazvali Emark Data Talks. Měli jsme původně v plánu udělat takový úplně malý raní, raní branč, ale vlastně jsme velmi rádi, že se vás sešlo tolik v tolik hodném počtu, takže doufám, že to pro vás bude přínosné a že se, že se spolu pustíme do toho, co vám chceme dnes ukázat. Pro ty z vás, kteří nás neznáte, moje jméno je Lukáš Neruchal, mám na starosti konzultační poradenské služby ve společnosti Emark. A dnes, pokud neznáte naši společnost Emark, tak krátké představení. Naše společnost je na trhu přes 19 let, z toho přes 12 let jsme dneska ve spolupráci s Klikem. Dostali jsme se až do té úrovně, že jsme nyní master reseller společnosti Klik, vlastně všech jejich produktů. Začali jsme jako konzultační služby, dneska vlastně jsme k tomu přidali i ty implementační služby, poradenské služby právě pro oblast business intelligence a datových analýz. Jsme i součástí partner advisory councilu Kliku, to znamená, že máme přímou nějakou možnost ovlivnit strategii kliku, co se týče technologického nebo jakým, smí, jakým směrem vlastně klik se, se vyvíjí. Dole vidíte pár našich pár našich významných klientů, někteří z vás jsou i tady, takže vám, vám děkujeme, že jste, že jste stále s námi. Co se týče kliku jako takového nebo té platformy, tak máme dnes asi 60 developerů, kteří se přímo věnují kliku, to znamená, jsme asi největší ten, řekněme, business intelligence developerský house pro tuto platformu, troufám si říct, ve střední Evropě. Otevřeli jsme i nyní pobočku v Austrálii, takže, takže se těšíme, že se i slovenská firma rozvíjí všemi, všemi směry a, a věříme, že, že budeme dále takto postupovat. Uh, jeden slide o kliku. Uh, je to industry leader, dneska už asi devátý rok v řadě uh, s Gartnerem. I když Gartner nás nemá úplně rád, pořád, pořád se tam někde, někde motáme u středu, ale zase, když se podíváte na Bark Survey, který je přímo od koncových uživatelů a uživatelů business intelligence systému, tak tam to vypadá jako dramaticky jinak. Nicméně jsme rádi, že, že Klik věnuje obrovské úsilí technologiím a posunu do nových technologií, což je vidět i v toho, že vlastně nakoupili v minulém roce společnost Etunity, o které se budeme bavit, o jejich produktech se dnes budeme bavit. A předtím ještě Podium Data, což je dnes vlastně produkt Click Data Catalyst. Takže to jsou, to jsou věci, které bychom dnes rádi s vámi probrali. Click má takovou strategii, že tak jak všichni znáte ty, ty standardní BI query nástroje, tak Click říká něco v tom smyslu, že data by měla být zkoumána, be explored rather than queried. A věříme v ten multiplikační efekt, to znamená opravdu stačit, stačit někde na začátku, v nějakém oddělení a potom vlastně ta, ta síla té platformy o to umožnit těm uživatelům přístup k těm datům, ten, který by potřebovali to od začátku, od těch, těch hrubých dat pomocí IT velmi jednoduše připravit ten datový katalog a potom těm koncovým biznis uživatelům nějakou jednoduchou formou umožnit vlastně si libovolně analyzovat ta data. To je asi to, o co se, o co se spolu s klikem snažíme. Klik to nazval jako třetí generaci BI vize, to znamená, z toho, z toho pojímání našeho je to tak, že ta data by měla být opravdu udržována, univerzálně přístupná, zabezpečená. Pak je potřeba vlastně ta druhá část, data literacy, to znamená, aby ti uživatelé taky věděli, co s tím mají dělat, to znamená, Věnujeme velké úsilí tomu, tomu zaškolení těch uživatelů, klik má vlastně v rámci, v rámci svých produktů i vlastně možnost školení, tréninku přímo jako součástí licenčních podmínek a podobně. A potom, aby ta data byla prostě k dispozici kdekoliv, jakkoliv z hlediska technologického, to znamená multicloud, on-premise, virtuální, prostě jak, jak si vzpomenete, napojit to, co potřebujete, to je vlastně takové zhrnutí toho, co se snažíme. Dnešním Dnešním tématem budou data governance, data management. Z hlediska této platformy, o kterých potom budou mluvit moji kolegové, je tam vlastně ten stěžení produkt Etunity, který opravdu stojí na začátku, to znamená, je to, je to věc, která umožňuje v podstatě data lake prep a data pipelines, automatizaci data warehouseů, tvorby spoustu use caseů, o, o kterých vám řekneme. Potom ve středu někde stojí data catalyst, čili je to nějaký takový business ready data catalog. Obě tyto věci jsou platformově nezávislé, to znamená, můžete to mít nad jakýmkoliv data warehousem, můžete to potom sunout buď do nějakých dalších řešení, nebo do nějakých dalších vašich, vašich BI řešení. Jsou to platformově nezávislá řešení. No a samozřejmě na konci té, 
toho řetězce stojí, stojí klik celá platforma, která umožňuje BI reporting, analytiku, vizualizaci, data science, prostě veškeré, veškeré potřeby, které, které dneska mohou, mohou nastat. Co se týče dat a společností dnes, tak asi nejzásadnější, co my vnímáme z toho pohledu, když, když pracujeme s našimi klienty, tak je, ta, tak je ta vlastně ten tlak na to, na to vybalancování mezi těmi náklady, na, samozřejmě na tu platformu a to, jakým způsobem potom ukázat, že co je ta hodnota v těch datech, jakým způsobem ta analytika opravdu reálně může přispět těm datům, jakým způsobem zrychlíme vlastně agilitu toho biznesu. A Velmi, velmi důležité je prostě najíst opravdu ty, ty kvalitní, kvalitní to říkáme use casey, ale opravdu jsou to, jsou to ty, ty scénáře, které vlastně pomohou tu, tu analytiku drivovat v těch společnostech. A to co, to, co je tady ten střední bod, to, co vnímáme jako právě ten problém k tomu, je, že pokud tam není ta jednoduchost toho zpracování a použití, tak se ve společnosti vytváří různé prostě datová taková nezávislá síla, která spolu nějakým způsobem nespolupracují nebo je velmi těžká je, je dostat mezi, mezi sebou, propojit. A to vnímáme právě jako, jako asi dneska největší problém mimo, mimo tu data literacy, to znamená to umění zaškolení těch, těch lidí, aby věděli, co, co ta data znamenají a jak použít ty případné nástroje, tak samozřejmě potom i, i v, rámci, v rámci té společnosti, aby vůbec spolupracovali mezi sebou i třeba jenom cross department. Když jsem naznačil, že data governance a data management, tak nemůžu vzpomenout tu vyvýšenou rovinu, což je enterprise information management, že všechna, všechny informace jsou data, ale ne všechna data informace. A dneska společnosti se samozřejmě snaží vytvořit nějaký enterprise information management, klik má vlastně enterprise data management, kvůli tomu, aby se maximálním způsobem automatizovaly procesy, aby se dokázal ten, ta společnost transformovat a samozřejmě využít těch rychle měnících se podmínek na trhu. To znamená využít nejen těch, těch dat, které má dostupná interně, ale i ale těch, těch externích. Tak jsem, ještě jsem si dovolil jeden slide teoretický předtím, než, než přejdeme, že se bavíme, že data management a data governance, že jak to teda vnímáme, tak... Asi, asi takový ten, to nejznámější kolečko je, je vlastně framework DAMA, Data Management, který říká, že ta data governance je prostě společná zodpovědnost biznesu a IT a je definována jako role, která, která umožňují, nebo data governance je vlastně ten framework, který nějakým způsobem nastavuje, co by se mělo udělat na té, na té datové, datové úrovni a data management jsou potom všechny ty, ty úkoly, řekněme nějaké ty, ty oblasti, které, kterými si chceme zabývat tak, aby to celé dávalo smysl, velmi zjednodušeně řečeno. Takže dneska to, o čem se budeme bavit a kde ta naše platforma v celé své šíři, ale podporuje většinu z těch oblastí toho data managementu, tak typicky společnosti začínají z metadata, dívají se na nějaký, na nějaký business, business katalog, samozřejmě řeší datovou bezpečnost, řeší referenční nějaké master data tabulky, data warehouse automation, prostě jsou to, jsou to všechny ty věci, které by měly být v rámci společnosti podchyceny a my vám ukážeme, doufám, že jakým způsobem dokážete velmi jednoduše zautomatizovat ty činnosti. Uh, jeden slide o Atunity, v řekolekové potom budou mít další, další prostě představení celé té platformy. Tady je vypíchnutých nějakých pět základních use caseů, kterým, které Atunity podporuje. První teda Analytics Ready Data Lake, opravdu automatizované vytváření, což vám potom kolega Makis ukáže, cloud data nebo warehouse data, jsou tam na to, na to případné nástroje. To, v čem je Atunity špička, naprostá špička, z hlediska vendor hodnocení Gartnera, tak je change data capture, to znamená real-time streamingování dat bez zátěže zdrojových systémů. To je naprosto zásadní, zásadní věc, to znamená třeba pokud máte SAP a potřebujete někam, někam přesunovat data do testovacího prostředí, tak tam je, tam je obrovská, obrovská síla a tunity a doufám, že se o tom pobavíme dále. Další věc je právě modernizace starých nějakých mainframeových systémů a query a float a, a podobně. A ta další část toho datového katalogu, velmi zjednodušeně řečeno, jde o to umožnit těm uživatelům, aby si v podstatě ty data, datasety nakupovali jako na standardním webshopu. To znamená, vy, vy sjedete v podstatě nějakou analýzu nad datovými zdroji, přidáte tam nějaká metadata, přidáte tam nějaká biznisová data, biznisové informace a ten uživatel má potom k dispozici ten datový katalog, 
na dva kliky vybere ten dataset, který potřebuje, dá se přímo exportovat buď do nějakých dalších řešení, nebo, nebo samozřejmě nativně do, do, do klik platformy, nebo do nějakých jakýkoliv jiných business intelligence řešení. A zase z pohledu IT je to velmi zajímavé v tom, že vidí, jak jsou ta data používaná, jaká je tam datová kvalita, protože si můžete nastavit nějaké, nějaké data, data quality testy v rámci toho, jak je to z hlediska operations a, a zase to věřím, že bude vlastně můj kolega Juraj, který vás tím provede. Naše společnost je založena na hodnotě. Máme tady CEO Martina, kterého, kterého můžu i pozdravit. A on vždycky tvrdí, že ano, ta hodnota, že o co, o co jde vždycky, o, o co v každém případě jde, je, je hodnota. A hodnota, ať už právě toho posunutí té společnosti v rámci transformace, nebo i toho jednotlivého business caseu, ale aby to dávalo smysl. Když to nedává smysl, tak ani, ani my se jako na to necítíme, aby jsme to dělali, protože to nedává potom smysl pro nikoho. A ta, ta hodnota třeba v případě toho klik data, data katalystu, což jsou nějaké informace, asi každý na nějaké prezentaci tam má nějaké, nějaké procenta, o kolik došlo ke zlepšení a podobně, ale v tomto případě reálně, reálně jak, jak uvidíte z těch, z těch ukázek, opravdu dochází až k takto, takto významným vlastně posunům z hlediska efektivity nebo redukce nákladů zrychlení, vlastně dokončení těch BI projektů a podobně. No a aby jsme u té hodnoty nezůstali jenom na té straně kliku, tak samozřejmě z pozice ještě sales directora vám musím ukázat jeden slide, to znamená, aby se vám to tak strašně líbilo, že byste chtěli využít poslední zbytky budžetu pro Q4, tak máme speciální akci dnes, že 30% slevu právě na klik data, data catalyst do konce roku, takže můžete, můžete veselé využít. Dneska jsem to četl ráno na Linkedu, přesně tak. Klik Data Catalyst byl patentovaný právě jako s tím zásadním propojením toho, co umožňuje a na to se těším, že vám pak kolega ukáže. Nyní bych představil ještě moje další kolegy přes řečníky. Za prvé začnu, teda, začnu od konce. Maky Smoulas, který je náš kolega z kliku, je to opravdu expert, <laughs> <laughs> Velký expert na vlastně celou platformu, Head of Solution Architects, Head of Presales, čili opravdu bych řekl, špička, co, kterou má klik v Evropě k dispozici, takže potom jste opravdu zváni na to, abyste zkusili spustit otázky. A budeme mít dispozici, uh, máme k dispozici uh, slido. Dobré, tak ještě vám pak uh, řekneme, že, že slido, myslím data, máš to napsané? Data Talks, tady to mám před sebou, jo. Uh, Data Talks BA, Data Talks BA na slajdu a můžete, můžete tam dávat otázky, které, které vám zodpovíme. Chtěl jsem mluvit o tom, že Maki se vám ukáže právě Etunity, uh, jako by ten jeden z těch, z těch posledních nákupů. Uh, potom tady máme ještě Mariuše, který se schovává, ale je to náš regionální manažer z kliku, takže taky jakékoliv dotazy a případně obchodní případy můžeme vyřídit na místě. <laughs> a pak uh, samozřejmě můj kolega Juraj Mišina, který je business klik uh, specialist a který ale, co je zase zajímavé, je klik luminary. To znamená, jestli nevíte, co to je luminary, když kliknete na stránku kliku, tak tam jsou jako seznam lidí z celého světa, takový top, klás 2019, kteří jsou přímo vlastně daní do popředí klikem v tom, jakým způsobem vlastně technologicky a, a znalostně pomáhají vlastně posunovat BI, BI informace a samozřejmě i klik, takže jsme rádi, že, že máme mezi sebou vlastně jako kolegu, který je, který je jeden z klik luminary. Takže teď bych už posunul to na Makise a poprosím Makis, yes. Uh, je tady někdo, uh, is there anyone English speaking, so we need to, because I didn't, I didn't, didn't ask at, at the beginning, so sorry for that. It's not exactly English, it's going to be Greek English. <laughs> I said the Czech English or Greek English, so we can select Greek, whatever. Yes. Okay. I don't know what Lukas said, but... One thing for sure is I'm not an expert. Right? I'm no expert at anything. Uh, <clears throat> so I've got the tendency, it's recording, right? Let me see. Okay. I've got the tendency of moving. Right? And that's not a good thing. So if you see me moving that way, just stop me. I know there's a pillar. And if I don't come that way, there is no personal thing with you guys, right? I need to stay here. I'll try to you know, stick in this position and not move at all, but it's impossible for me. So I think that we all know nowadays that Click has a, a broad spectrum of, of components, products, anything from data acquisition 
manipulation, data management, up to analytics. Right? Today we're going to focus on the data management side of things, data integration, data management side of things. The dawn of postmodern analytics, and I'm calling it as the postmodern analytics because simply we have already started marching into the third generation of BI platforms, third generation of analytics. The first one being the traditional IT-led, initiated, managed projects. Right? Everything was managed and handled by IT, getting the data, building the dashboards, handing it over to users, and that's it. Then um, we moved to the second generation, which was the self-service uh, self BI with uh, data discovery and business discovery. So we got a bit more decentralized. Now, the third generation of, of BI platforms is characterized by the data democratization. Right? What does this mean? It simply means that we need to take into account the whole, you know, the, the vast landscape, data landscape that exists out there, get this data, and at the end of the day, deliver it to the business users. Right? So if there is a single term that we could use, I could use, in order to characterize the third generation of, of BI platforms, that would be data democratization. So we move from centralized to decentralized and now to democratized. Now, if we take a step backwards in time, and this is going to support the importance of data democratization, we're going to see where the power used to lie and where the power now lies. So, a long time ago, the power used to lie with whomever owned land. And we've seen it in the movies again and again and again. So, whoever owned land at that time was more powerful than the governor, the, uh, the sheriff, and the bank owner together put together. So they were calling the shots, whoever owned land. Then we had the industrial revolution, combustion engine, steam engine. So the power moved to those who were dealing with energy and the industries. Now we moved to the third era where the power lies within those that hold information and only hold information, but have the ability to exploit information. And if you don't believe me, because I wouldn't believe me, this is the market cap for 2018 of the top five companies. Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, which is the mother company of Google, Microsoft, Facebook. If there is one common thing amongst these companies, it's the fact that they hold vast amounts of information. And not only do they hold vast amounts of information, but they also exploit it. And if we compare against 10 years ago, we're going to see that most of the companies that were the top five at that era, they used to deal with energy. Even Gartner, right, who, which is not very friendly to click for some reason, I don't know why, they say that the modern BI platform supports IT-enabled analytic content development, self-contained architecture that enables non-technical users to autonomously execute analytic workflows from data access, ingestion, preparation, interactive analytics. Data democratization. This is the definition of data democratization. Getting the data that exists out there and putting it in the hands of the business users. Right? So this is what is driving the third generation of analytical platforms. And that is one of the main reasons why we focus on the data management side of things. And that is one of the main reasons why we have this session today, talking about data management and more specifically, Attunity and uh, Data Catalyst. Now, Click's data management strategy is, is driven by three main pillars or three main principles, if you wish. Number one, real-time data. Everybody for the past 10 years is talking about real-time data, real-time reporting. Now it's there. It's very important to be able to transfer data across in real time. It's not efficient to start doing analytics, reporting, or whatever we want to do, accessing the transactional systems. It doesn't work. It will never work. These systems are not made in order to uh, satisfy analytical queries. On top of this, we cannot put any burden on the transactional systems. So what we need to do is somehow transfer in real-time mode 
as real time as it gets data from the transactional systems across. Number two, agile data delivery. Okay, we transfer data, done. What are we gonna do with this data? Right. We don't want this data to sit there. So we need to find a way, an agile way, an efficient way, an effective way, so as to transform this data into analytic friendly structures and hand it over to the users. We know that traditionally the way we used to do it and we still do it and most probably will do it in the future as well is by building data marts, building star schemas, building data warehouses and so on and so forth. Whoever has experience around this kind of technologies and approaches, you would know that it's not a simple task. It's not something that we do within a couple of weeks time. Right? So we need to find a way just to easily take the replicated structures and build them or transform them in analytics-ready data structures. And this process needs to be automated. Right? So this is what agile data delivery is all about. And third principle, enterprise ready. And we're not referring to enterprise readiness only in terms of performance, scalability, security, and so on and so forth. Since we're gonna deliver the data to the end users, because these are our customers at the end of the day, we need to make sure that the data is trustworthy, the data is cleansed, the data is prepared. This will make the end user's life much easier because they will see the data sets, as you're gonna see later on in the demo, they will see the data sets, they will trust the data sets, they will choose the data sets they wanna work with, and then they're on their own. Now, when it comes to the product positioning or the product portfolio, uh, related to the data integration or data management strategy, you can see that nowadays we um, address all the requirements end-to-end -end from the data acquisition, real-time change data capture, automating the process of building analytics-ready ready, uh, structures like data lakes or data warehouses or data marts, then onboarding the data building catalogs on the data, building a marketplace of the data set, assigning metadata on the data sets, and then provisioning these data sets to the end users. So end-to-end, -end, full functionality. Now, Atunity. There are three main pillars or three main um, characteristics that make Atunity stand out from the competition. Number one, leader in change data capture. As I said earlier, we need to be able to transfer data in real time. Change data capture is, is that my laptop making the noise? So change data capture is, is the process, is the approach that is the less intrusive on the source database, as we're gonna see later on. And it manages to get data in real time mode from your systems and transfer it cross-platform. So maybe, and that's really important, so maybe currently you have an Oracle database on premise and you wanna transfer the data, replicate the data on Snowflake on the cloud. Or you have a SQL server on premise and you wanna transfer the data in Azure. Or you have a MySQL database and you wanna transfer the data to multiple technologies. So real-time change data capture, the best technology you can find out there in the market. And on top of this, it also manages to close the loop. What does it mean? It means that if you're gonna read data from a SQL server, for example, and transfer it to an Oracle database, you also need to do some conversions because the data types, for instance, are not the same. Right? So Atunity takes into consideration these facts and also does the tra uh, transformation. So it changes the data types and also converts the data to different technologies. So huge cross-platform um, support. Second, leader in integration and when it comes to technology partnerships. So the technology partnerships that Atunity has are second to none. And technology partnerships not only related to the business uh, level, but also on the technical level and R&D. And this is very, very important to you. Why? Because it's a guarantee that you will never be locked down to any, any vendor. Right. So nowadays, you're working with Oracle. Tomorrow, you might be working with uh, SQL Server. The day after tomorrow, you will be working with Hadoop systems. 
and then uh, Snowflake and so on and so forth. We don't care what kind of technology you are currently employing or you're thinking to employ in the near future or in the long term future. Right? So the technology partnerships, again, are second to none. And this is a guarantee that you will not get at any time get locked to um, a single vendor. And number three, leader in terms of automating the process of building data marts, data warehouses, data lakes. Again, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. If, if we have a look at the process of building data marts, data warehouses, building ETL processes, uh, following some sort of theory like dimensional data stores or 3NFs and, and so on and so forth, we need to know what we're doing. Right? It's not a simple uh, task. We need to know um, what kind of data model we're going to employ. We need to know how we're going to deploy slowly changing dimensions. We need to know what surrogate keys are. We need to build the data model. We need to have conformed data marks possibly. So these are things that we need to have in mind in order to build analytics ready you know, data structures. Not an easy task and not a fast, I'd say, task. Attunity automates, fully automates the process of getting the data and transforming them into analytics ready data structures like data warehouses and data marts. So we don't anymore need to have in mind how am I going to build a data model, a dimensional data store with surrogate keys and conform dimensions and what kind of mappings am I going to build, what kind of ETL processes am I going to build in order to transfer data across and, and transform the data. I think it's one of the cables, it doesn't. Yeah, but I was trying at least to stay. Anyway, so Attunity manages to automate this process and make our lives easier. Now, three main um, use cases, I'd call them, generic, very generic use cases. Um, number one, uh, cloud application development and modernizing our systems. Again, cloud, is on its way. Maybe you have adopted some cloud technologies. Maybe you're thinking about adopting some cloud technologies or moving some of your components on the cloud. Attunity is the leader and it's being used in order to transfer uh, uh, data from on-premise onto the cloud or cross-platform. So again, an example, you could have an Oracle on-premise database. You might want to go to Snowflake on the cloud or Azure and so on and so forth. Using Attunity, as we're going to see, you get the data, transfer them across, that's it. No headaches, done. Number two, automating uh, the process of building, designing, defining, and ma maintaining data warehouses. As I said earlier, it gets the data, it automatically identifies and populates the data model, it builds all the DDL and DML, data definition language and data manipulation language necessary in order to build forward engineer and deploy the data model. So it gives us peace of mind. And the same concept applies on the data lakes as well. So it manages to automate the process of stitching together different types of data sets, structured, unstructured, semi-structured, populate the data lake, populate the structures of a data lake, and then we can apply more advanced algorithms like machine learning, AI, and so on and so forth. It also manages to build the metadata required for data lakes, like, for example, the hive structures we need to build. Now, there are three main products or components on the Attunity platform. Number one, it's called Replicate, so Attunity Replicate. This is the component that allows us to do real-time data transfer or replication from one source to one or multiple targets. Okay? Because you may want to uh, take your data that exists in a SQL server and replicate it across different technologies in a Snowflake, in an Azure SQL server, and on Oracle Cloud. It uses CDC change data capture um, approach and technologies, and it acts in a non-intrusive way. What does this mean? It means that we don't put 
any burden on the transactional system, on your source database. We don't issue any queries. What we do is we access the transactional logs. So if you have a transaction that affects one million or one billion records, we don't transfer one million records or one billion records. We only transfer the transaction and we apply it on the target system, which means that the latency and the amount of data that is, is getting transferred between the systems is as minimum as possible, number one. And number two, we're not touching the source database. The second product or component is called Compose, and it comes in two different flavors, Compose for data warehouses and Compose for data lakes. The idea is that Compose, Attunity Compose, manages to automate the process of building data warehouses and data marts and building data lakes, as simple as that. So it does acquire the data, it transforms the data, it creates automatically the data models, it creates the mappings, the ETLing processes, creates the DDL and the DML, and then generates the statements and executes them on the target systems. And third component is the management uh, control, the management environment. You understand that in an enterprise deployment, we need a management control in order to be able to monitor and govern and, and manage everything. When it comes to cross-platform support, this is just a list of technologies that are supported. So you can see that it's very, very difficult to find something that is not or will not be supported, even mainframes. So for example, if you want to reduce the cost of your mainframes because you're paying based on the workload, you can also transfer or replicate your mainframe system and you can reduce the cost of ownership. SAP systems, move data out of SAP systems possibly. Right? They move them on the cloud so you can have better elasticity, better control over what kind of hardware, how much, how many resources we're gonna use, and so on and so forth. So four things we need to have in mind when it comes to, to Attunity. Real-time data transfer, as real-time as it gets in a non-intrusive way by uh, accessing the transaction logs and not the actual database. Heterogeneous support, we don't care what kind of technologies you are currently working on or what you're gonna work with in the near future or far future. Complete, so end-to-end, -end, from data acquisition, manipulation, transformation, automating the process of building data warehouses and data marts. And independence, independence in the sense that, again, you're not locked to any vendor. There is no hidden agenda behind the scenes. Now, I prefer to, to keep theory a bit um, short because otherwise everybody will, will fall asleep. So what we're gonna see is I'm gonna try to show you what I've been talking about uh, all this time. So we're gonna go through a demo the, the story behind the demo is the following. I'm going to have a source database which is going to be uh, a MySQL database. And I'm going to replicate this database, a schema of this database, in a SQL Server database. So it's going to be one-to-one. -one. And after I replicate the data on the SQL Server database, I'm going to use Compose. So this is going to be the replicate component. So once I replicate the data, I'm going to use Compose in order to build a, data, a small data warehouse, and on top of that data warehouse, I'm going to build a small data mart, as simple as that. The data warehouse and the data mart will be built on the SQL Server. Okay, so that's going to be the process. And you're going to see that I'm not going to type in a single line of code. I'm not going to change any single of, um, uh, component, ETL mapping, or, or functionality. So, replicate. This is my SQL Server. This is my target system. This is where I'm gonna replicate the data, build the data warehouse, build the data marts. And this is my SQL, this is my source. So the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna create two new databases. Replic 
replica. I'm going to name them OLTP replica and DW. So you're going to see that I have no tables. These are just empty databases. Okay, two empty databases. The o, uh, MOLTP replica will hold the replica of uh, the SQL database, the MySQL database, and then based on this data set, I'm going to populate the MDW schema. I've got two connections. One connection is against my source system. This is MySQL database. The other connection is against my uh, SQL server. So this is going to be my target. This is my task. So this is the task that will get the data across. Unidirectional. Can you see the screen? Okay. So unidirectional, one way. MySQL, SQL Server, done. Bidirectional, two-way. MySQL, SQL Server, SQL Server, MySQL. Why? One scenario could be that I'm using it as a disaster recovery scenario. So my, my uh, primary site is MySQL, my disaster site is the SQL Server. So if my primary site fails, I'm switching to the disaster site. So transactions take place on the disaster site. When the primary site comes up, I need to replicate all the changes back to my primary site. So it needs to be two-way, right? Logstream. Logstream means that I'm saving the changes. So I'm getting the changes from my source database and I'm saving them somewhere because I want the same changes to apply them across different systems. Okay, so in this case, I've got one too many. I'm getting the changes from my source database and I want to apply the changes in multiple systems, in Snowflake, in SQL Server, and in an Oracle database. Full load, get the full data set, transfer it across. Apply changes, get the changes that happen in search, updates, deletes, move them across. Store changes means that I'm going to store all the alterations in an intermediate zone because these changes, I want to process them later on and do something different with these changes. Source, target. Source, target. Done. Which schema? Sales. These are my tables. I'm going to replicate everything. I'm going to leave one table aside. That's it. So if I execute this process, it's going to take everything from MySQL, transfer it across to the SQL Server, create the DDLs, generate the DDLs, create the tables, the fields, referential integrity, populate the data, transform the data. Of course, if I want to do some sort of transformation on the way, or let's take, for example, one table and add a new column. Quantity. Simple stuff, quantity times price. And execute. I remind you, there is nothing, this, this database, the, the OLTP replica is empty. So when I execute the process, assuming that everything will go right, and there's not gonna be any unforeseen events, data is getting transferred from the MySQL database to the SQL server. And 
if I go back and refresh, what is it? Refresh. So these are the tables created. So it automatically read the entities of the SQL server of the SQL database, MySQL, and transferred everything across to the uh, SQL server. So this is a query I'm gonna execute on the SQL server. So far, so good, simple stuff, right? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have an insert and update and a delete statement on the source database. And I'm gonna see that without doing anything else, these uh, statements will be transferred across to my target system. So I'll go to my source database. So you, you, you can see that for this customer, city is Brno, and I've got a customer with a, with a name, with an ID, new ID. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play, uh, update the city and put Bratislava. I'm gonna delete the customer with the ID, new ID, and I'm gonna insert a new record. Okay, one update, one insert, one delete. Going back without doing anything else. I'm just gonna wait no, a bit. So I've got one insert, one update, one delete. Everything that I applied on my source system has been transferred across real-time replication, as real-time as it gets. So if I execute the exact same query, you're gonna see that the city will uh, will be Bratislava, new ID will have been removed, and there will be a new customer ID here, hopefully. Okay. City updated, customer ID has been removed, and one extra customer ID has been added without doing anything else. And if you have a look at the order details table, you're going to see that I do have the new column I also defined. I, so I can do some sort of transformations during the replication task. As simple as that. Even Marius could do the demo. Um, so this is Replicate. And we're gonna move to the more complicated stuff. If you can say it's complicated. Any questions on the Replicate so far? Or you wanna leave questions to the end? Record what? Uh, the questions and answers. And there is uh, one. You want to leave it yes. for the end, or do you want to uh, take may, it now? Maybe this, this one, because this, um, this is the, what are the key differentiators for the CDC feature at Unity versus Oracle Golden Gate, briefly. <laughs> I'm not an Oracle expert. I'm not an Oracle expert. But we were talking about the, the user, user experience, basically, and the si simple <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, simplifying uh, uh, stuff, right? <laughs> but you need to stop recording. <laughs> if I am to, to respond to this question, you need to stop recording. <laughs> okay, so we will take it's, it it's, off record after, it's after a political, the session. It's a political right? situation. Okay. Good. <laughs> so, you know, when it comes to competitive um, uh, comparison or discussions, it's something I really hate because uh, if you ask me, it all boils down to what kind of requirements you have. So based on the requirements, Maybe Atunity is the best solution. Maybe Oracle is the best solution. Maybe Talent is the best solution. So it depends, it depends on the requirements. On top of that, Oracle Golden Gate, because the question is about Golden Gate, I assume. Right? Or Oracle Golden Gate might not have this functionality today as we speak. In the next version, since we're not Oracle experts, they might have it. So what's the benefit? On the, on the flip side of the, of the coin, Oracle will say Atunity, they don't do that. They don't know if in the next release it's gonna be included or not. Or I'm gonna tell you, uh, Atunity is the best technology you can have in order to, to replicate or work cross-platform, right? From Oracle to, I don't know, to uh, Snowflake, to MongoDB. And you're gonna tell me, I don't care. I'm, not, I'm never gonna use MongoDB, so. 
So my point is that it all boils down to your individual um, requirements. Okay, that's why I don't want to give a very very specific. Yes, please. This is a Tajiki answer, I know, but <laughs> that's why I said we need to stop recording. If we stop recording, then yes, I will respond off the record. Yes. Morning. Morning. In terms of? Sorry, I don't want to ask too technical of a question, but for me, uh, I'm audit listening, yeah. auditability, uh, the transfer of that data that you showed us in this demo, if I was an auditor and I want to see uh, that the data was completely transferred, where can I see that? If you want to see? If I wanted to see that the data was completely transferred, there was no in data logs. loss. In the logs. In the logs. So yeah. there are logs that I can yes. see. Yes, yes. Super. There is. What is it? Log management and new logs. So you see everything that takes place during the process. Your question is a bit more clever, I'd say, because that's the, that's the easy answer. The logs will say this number of records have been transferred across. Right? How do you know if it is a complete data set? This is one of the detail of those logs, so, right? You'll get it's the details, but if you ask me, my personal approach would be have a process that will compare your source data with your target data. So this process will never fail you because even if the logs uh, mention that you know this number of records have been transferred, you don't know if it is the whole the complete data. It's supposed to be the complete data set, yes, because we never leave any data uh, behind because what we do, as I said, we're not reading the data, we're reading the transaction logs. So we're applying exactly the same transactions on the other end of the river, right? So we're not missing anything. Everything is, is consistent. And that has another um, benefit as well because there are technologies that when they transfer data across, they transfer blocks. So they transfer the block of the database across. Now, if the block is corrupted, they will transfer a corrupted block. All right? So corrupted on the source system, corrupted on the uh, target system. Useless. Whereas using the transaction logs, you don't get these corrupted blocks. You don't move blocks on the storage. You move transactions. You reapply the transactions. Um, compose. What does Compose do? An extra 10% discount, right? <laughs> New project. Just the name. Four steps I need to follow for a Compose. This is Compose for Data Warehouses, by the way. Four, four steps that I need to follow in, in Compose. Number one, define my databases. What does this mean? Source targets. As simple as that. This is my source. This is my target. Number two, define the model. So define the data model of my data warehouse. Number three, create the data warehouse. So forward engineer the data model and build the entities that will support the data warehouse. Number four, data marts. Build, automatically design and build the data marts. So these are the four uh, steps. Number one, new data warehouse. I'm going to call it MDW, it's a SQL server. It's located on my laptop. The database is MDW, DBO schema. And I'm going to have the same schema for simplicity reasons. I'm going to define the same schema both for the data warehouse as well as the data match. You can have different schemas. Usually we, we do have different schemas in order to separate, but 
For simplicity reasons, I'm going to keep it like that. So I've defined my target system. I'm going to define my source system as well. First step done. Defined source, target. Nothing complicated. Right? Now what I need to do is I need to define my data model, my data warehouse data model. All right? I have three different ways that I can do it. Reverse engineer. So the data model, the sales data model that I'm going to read Attunity is going to reverse engineer it, and it's going to give me the structures, the referential integrity, the fields, the data types, everything. Number two, use Erwin. Are you familiar with Erwin? So Erwin is a graphical user interface. It's a tool through which we, we de design data models, referential integrity, foreign keys, primary keys, dependencies, and so on and so forth. And Erwin forward engineers this data model based on the target technology and creates the data model on the target technology. So we can have a schema on Erwin and create it here, reuse the schema, the data model we have on Erwin. And number three, uh, do it customly. Start designing the, the, the data warehouse schema manually. Since I'm too lazy, I'm going to discover the schema, which means I'm going to read the tables coming from my source schema, and I'm going to reuse the same data model. OK. Let me remove that. So this is what I get, simple stuff. These are the tables. Referential integrity, primary keys, foreign keys, um, the relationship. So this is the, the schema I'm gonna I'm gonna use. Now on top of that schema, I'm gonna add some date and time dimensions. Why? Because usually when we deal with data warehouses, we need some extra structures that will define the dates, the quarters, if it is current year, if it is last year, because usually in data warehouse and data match we do uh, um, period over period comparison and, and so on and so forth. Now, what you see right now is the logical model. These are the logical entities, the tables, right? But as we said, Attunity is going to create a physical data warehouse. So this logical data model, which you draw on a paper nicely and it's easy, is translated into these structures, this set of tables. So this is the physical schema. So this is the physical representation of the logical schema, which is relatively simple. At this point, I need to just mention that there are three main theories uh, or approaches to building data warehouses. The first approach was introduced by Bill Inman, and this is the, uh, the 3NF, the third normal form, with the creation of the operational data stores. So uh, third normalized uh, uh, form schemas with referential integrity, detail level, and so on and so forth. The second approach was introduced by Bill Inman, and this is the, uh, by Ralph Kimball, and that is the dimensional data store. So maybe you've heard about it, data marts, dimensions, fact tables. 
And the third theory is called Data Vault, which brings the benefits of the other two theories. The approach uh, that Attunity follows is based on the Data Vault uh, theory. And that is why you can see there tables with uh, suffix hub and s. So the Data Vault approach separates or distinguishes tables into hubs, satellites, and link tables. So hub tables are holding all the business keys. Uh, satellite tables actually hold the information. So you will see that if we have a look at the categories hub, it has the business table, uh, the business uh, keys plus the uh, insert and update dates, whereas the category satellite table has all the information. Why do we structure the data in such a way? Because we want to analyze data at the end of the day. We want it to be flexible, we want it to be fast, and we also want this, this schema to support different types of analysis, and we want it to support, for example, slowly changing dimensions. Are we familiar with slowly changing dimensions? Yes? No. So just briefly. Slowly changing dimensions is, is, um, is something we usually take advantage of when analyzing data and data warehouses. So in data warehouses, there is a principle that says we never delete records, never. In a transactional system, you may delete a record manually, by mistake, whatever. In a data warehouse, you never ever delete a record. You have the record, but you close it. You have a flag or you have a way that you define that this record has been deleted in the source system. In the same manner, if you do updates on your transactional system, your transactional system will hold the latest status, the latest value. So for example, I updated the city and I updated from Brno to Bratislava. So my transactional system has only the latest value, which is, which is Bratislava. In a data warehouse, we need to keep full history. We need to know that up until five minutes ago, the city was Brno. Five minutes ago, until the end of the universe, until it changes again, it's Bratislava. So this is the principle behind slowly changing dimensions. And in order to do that, we need to have um, the underlying structures that will support it. Like, for example, from and to date. So in here, there is an FD, there is a TD. The from date, a to date. I didn't do anything, right? This is the theory. Best practices applied on the data model. And you're going to see later on that this will be created on my target. And not only that, but the, the, the necessary mappings and transformations will be automatically generated and populated. So I won't do anything. I don't need to be an expert in, in, in building and designing data warehouses or data models. Of course. It depends what kind of question it's going to be. Related to the approach of generating the structures, mm -hmm. if, you somehow, uh, if you somehow incorporate the uh, GDPR stuff, so in case we are building a history and we need to remove something relevant there, uh, what's the approach here, if you somehow consider that? So GDPR, I will, I will let... Uh, my colleagues from EMARC answer that because they're experts in GDPR, but what I can say is that GDPR is, is a concept. Right? How you deploy and how you implement that concept differs. So it's not related in any way to the technology as such. It's related to the implementation. I don't know, am I correct? Well, basically, yes, but um, basically, uh, I, I, no, think, I think that... I am correct, period, done. <laughs> So, we, <laughs> you know, let's go. <laughs> we, ha we have coffee break anyway, Marcus, so we can... <laughs> I'm having my coffee here. No, uh, I, maybe, probably, probably the question was related to the, you know, well-known, and I would say public and marketed fact of, you know, forgot me uh, when I want you to clear all my data everywhere. So, uh, 
in in that in that case uh, it's exactly <laughs> how Maki said it's on on the process way because we can we can still i believe from the from the legal point of view we can still uh, keep it uh, in the warehouse but but uh, then in the special one and and a hashed or or something like that right because uh, Trinity also uh, includes potential mm. hashing of of uh, the transaction so if i set it on the process level so I can I can still keep all the information there, but but have it have it yeah. or something. But again, it's not related to the technology. It's related to the implementation, right? And 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 what kind of principles I follow? Because if the customer asks me to delete the data, I need to delete it, right? Second step done. Third step, by the way, nothing has been generated here. Right? So if I open the DW schema, there is nothing. It's still empty, which means that the only thing I've done so far is define the data model. That's it. Now I'm creating the data warehouse, which essentially means I'm forward engineering my data model creating it on my target. And these are the tables. So you can see there is a prefix, there is a suffix, which of course you can change. Right? But you know that this is the hub table, this is the satellite table. If I query them, you're going to see there are no rows, just an initialization row. The tables are empty. I just created the data model, and that's it. You have full access to the mappings, to the processes, which have been automatically created, like, for example, the mapping of, of the fields. You can also do several stuff, like, let me put a data uh, quality or a validation rule that will say, to, to discount should be less than 3%. What kind of discounts we give? 0.2 or 20%, which is 0.2. Discount <coughs> less than 0.2. Too lazy. Generate the mappings, the ETL links. You can see all the commands that have been generated here. So for example, of course, if you want to see, you just see, double click and see the command. And execute. What it will do, hopefully, is it's going to read the data from the data model, transform it, apply the rules that I have defined, a simple rule checking that the, um, the discount should be less than uh, 20%, and populating the data mart, which means the hub tables, the satellite tables. I have 154 rows which are reported, so that did not meet my validation rule. And if I query my data warehouse, so again the categories table, I'm going to see the data has been populated in there. And execute. So data has been transferred from the data um, from my data source and populated the data warehouse in the appropriate structures, hub, satellite tables. Last step, build the data mart. Give it a name. Let's keep it. Transactional data mart, so low level detail. Transactional detail, aggregated data mart. Let's keep the transactional. My fact table is the order details. My dimensions, I don't want orders as a dimension. 
let's also include the order date. So this is the data mart that's going to be created. Data mart is like a star schema. Fact tables, dimension tables. Transaction date is my order date. Finish. So this is what is going to be generated. Create the tables on my target structure. So you're going to see if I refresh the tables. Refresh. A new set of tables has been created with the prefix TDMA that has the dimensions and the fact tables, which are empty. At this point in time, they're empty. So generate and then run. This process will read my data warehouse schema and will populate my data mart. Done. So if I go back to my database and I query that, I'm having now data for my data mart. So this is the process. And the last step is I'm going to create a workflow just to stitch all the steps together, everything together. I'm going to create a workflow that will get the changes from my SQL database, replicate it to the SQL server. Then these changes will be reflected on the data warehouse and then on the data mart. So end to end. Let's call it M O L T P two T W workflow. Save, close. So what I'm going to do now in order to test it, I'm going to run another um, update statement. So currently city is Bratislava. So let me change, let me delete the element, put back a new customer. And update it and put Vienna for example. Execute. And then around this. So currently what I did is I made some changes on MySQL database, which is my primary source. And the workflow now is going to pick up those changes, replicate them from MySQL to the uh, SQL Server database. From the SQL Server database, it's going to populate or alter the appropriate records on the data warehouse, and it's going to move the changes to the data mart as well. Fingers crossed. This is going to be my new record, so Vienna. Okay. This is my transactional system, so I just have the latest uh, view. I lost Bratislava in my transactional system. In my data warehouse, I have two records. From, let me move that here. From date to date, from date to date. So from the beginning of the universe, from 1780, up until two minutes ago, the value was Bratislava. From that time, two minutes ago, up until the end of the universe, 9,999, which means the current value of this record is Vienna. So this is how we keep one way that we follow in order to keep slowly changing dimensions. So at any given point in time, I know what value was assigned. And this is important, for example, okay, in, in the city's um, aspect, it might not be very, uh, very important, but when you distribute commissions, let's assume you're a salesperson, 
right? And you have an account. So Vodafone account is my account. But tomorrow, Vodafone goes to Marius, right? How are we going to distribute the, the, um, the commissions? We need to have this history and know that up until now it's mine. From tomorrow onwards, it's Marius's. So we need to have the full history of, of how the data move. And this is one of the definitions, one of the components that define a data warehouse, right? It doesn't know what time is. It's, it's, it's independent of time. It has the full history. And on the data mart side of things, again, I'm having two records, Bratislava and Vienna. So I'm keeping the full history of everything. Questions? So DDL, this is, the question is what happens if we have DDL, if we have changes on the source system, if we add the column, right? Everything is transferred across. Is transferred, is replicated across, even DDL, DDL changes. If I want to change something in mapping, should I do it? You go into the mapping and you just change it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, what is it? This is my project. These are your mappings. Just, just go in there, you change the function, or you can add a new column, or you can change the logic, the ETL. You have full control over the, uh, the statements themselves. So if you add the column, there is nothing happening to the history. If I change There's the mapping, some uh, function is there different or something like that. The, 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 experience, the, uh, the calculation feature is different. If the calculation feature is different, then there's going to be a new value. Right? So uh, let's assume you change the calculation, right? How does it affect the data model? It doesn't. You just change the business logic behind the calculation, right? So the old values will remain there. If you have a slowly changing dimension, for example, let me close that. In the data model, you can also choose not, so this is the column history. So uh, this defines if we're gonna keep, if we're gonna keep history or not. So type one means we don't keep history. Type two means we do keep history, which means we do slowly changing dimensions, type two. Now, for example, in some columns, it, it doesn't make sense keeping history, like uh, gender. Right? It's OK, I can change gender, but it's, it's very rare. So there is no point in, in keeping history on the gender side. On other uh, columns like uh, city and marital status and so on and so forth, yes. If you change the calculation method or the business logic of a calculation, it does not affect in any way the data model of your target. It just changes the values. So if the values follow a type 2 SCD, slowly changing dimensions, you will keep history. But the business logic will be in the mapping and the ETLing. It will not affect the data model as such. What will affect the data model is alterations on the data model. So DDL, change of a data type, adding a column, removing a column. Okay, so regarding the change in calculation feature, you suggest to add a new column and do all the calculations there. Regarding the history recalculation, you do not care. It's up to you to define how, how you're going to deal with that. Some customers do not add a new column because it confuses. Imagine having a column saying amount and a second column saying amount to. So amount is the old way of calculating the amount. Amount to is the new way of calculating. That's, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So if you go down that road, my experience says You've lost the game. <laughs> because people will get confused. Who knows what amount and amount to is? 
Only you. Nobody else knows what's the definition of amount and amount to. So usually, you keep, you either keep amount as a single column and the calculation is changed in the future values. So history is kept with the way you used to calculate amount and all the new rows, all the new values will be calculated with a new way. That's number one, if that is correct. Number two, you recalculate the whole amount column based on the new way. It depends what's right on the business, what the business wants. Okay, I, I would like to step into this because uh, we are kind of 10 minutes over, but uh, it's very interesting and we also have many questions in, in the Slido. So uh, it, it really depends on you whether you would like to, to continue with the uh, discussion with Mekis. I think there are some interesting questions. I saw uh, one a question in the back as well. So uh, we, can, we can expand for another 10 minutes if you will, and then uh, we will have a really short break and then we'll continue if you agree. Yeah? Okay, thanks. Uh, you have mentioned uh, data mappings, uh, and I would like to s maybe step here with a question and ask, um, you know, like if the data mapping changes, does the system support track changes or history? Mm -hmm. So if the mapping changes, it means that the ETL can, process... Can we like change. report on the changes of the, you know, like mappings or, or potentially the calculations? Can I see those changes so if you can get it from the system itself yes yes so you do keep history you do have the history so you you, you do get to know what changed when did it change and what was the change so even throughout the process So there, there are a few. How do you define data lake was one. How code generators deal with typically inefficient queries. And then there is one about attunity performance with systems to which data is loaded in large batches. So which one? Which one? Is there any pref <laughs> preferential <laughs> vote? Preferential <laughs> vote for okay, any of Let's this? take the first one, yeah. one by one. What is the first one? How could generators deal with typically inefficient queries, especially when connecting various platforms? So, inefficient queries, what exactly? Would does you like this to mean? specify? So, the does, does this mean? Question. Does this mean whether the system will generate performant code? Is that the question? The question is how can you generate code that really will be usable? Mm -hmm. So the, um, the system generates what it believes to be the best performing code f based on the target system. And especially when it comes, and we're talking about simple stuff like inserts, updates, deletes, and, and the mappings, the transformations. On top of that, don't forget that the, uh, the content that is being generated is generated by Atunity. So Atunity, if, you, if we have a look at the mappings, also generates the indexes. Okay, so there is, there is a list, there is a task in the, in the mapping process where Atunity generates indexes on the tables that it creates. So based on the target technology, Atunity produces optimized code. Now, if you ask me if that code, if you can change it, yes, you can change it. For example, if you believe that there could be a hint used in the SQL statement that will make the statement get executed faster, you can go ahead and change it. Okay, so you just uh, do distinguish between the technicalities of the language of the particular platform, for example, or I mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you basically do not care about the usage of the results. 
So that's my job then to uh, optimize the queries to be used. The, which queries? The queries of retrieving data? I consider that this, uh, this transformation, mm -hmm. this mapping is done on the stuff, is supposed to be optimal the way how it is generated. Mm -hmm. It, de it, de it depends, it depends, because the rule of thumb says that if, if an, uh, an update statement, if any statement that changes the records accesses more than 10% of the total number of records, it shouldn't go with the index. It should not, but then please tell me how do you distinguish within your optimized workflow? Mm -hmm. So it produces the SQL statements, and the SQL statements are optimized based on the target system. So they're using indexes if necessary, and don't forget that when you talking about Oracle databases, for example, when I'm going to issue a SQL statement, the Oracle database has its own optimizer. Right? So the Oracle database will define and decide whether that statement is going to use the index or do a full table scan. So the, the, the statement itself leverages the optimizer of the database. Okay, so we discussed the topic regarding efficiency. So that's why I'm asking whether mm -hmm. your system is capable to provide, for example, special links in case this is needed. To, to improve the performance of the uh, target system, no, no. This is, this is the responsibility of a DBA in most cases, right? And um, in some cases, the developer of, of the code. If the system needs to be optimized and how it should be optimized. And which code? Which? Which code? Which code? The, the, uh, the developer that builds uh, possibly the ETL code, if you're not using Antunity or if you're using Informatio or whatever, uh, the person who develops the code that to be optimized. Okay. And there was a question about the relations and between one source and one target versus more sources on one target. So Again, we, 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 you just show one source to one target, okay. but it's, uh, it's could possible be, to Could be source to multiple sources, targets. Yeah. Could be sourced to multiple uh, targets. There is no limitation with regards to that. It can be more sources to, to one target. Uh, more sources to one target. Uh, you could also do that. Multiple, uh, multiple to one, many mm -hmm. to one. Okay. And how does Etunity perform with systems to which data is loaded in large batches? Which means? Which means? <laughs> We're moving away from real time to batch. <clears throat> you can do batch loading as well in, in Atunity. Right? In instead of doing real time, you're doing it in batch modes. There is no problem. Okay. I think that there was. But I think that was not the question. Yeah. The question was something different. Would anyone like to specify this question? Or? No? Or well, maybe it was answered well. Okay. So. <laughs> and that was the one, how would you define the data link? <laughs> Open up a browser. Go to Google, <laughs> Wikipedia. Uh, that's, that's a huge, that's a huge disc uh, <laughs> data link. So that's a huge discussion. Uh, data, data link, <laughs> how do you define the? So, a data lake, uh, like a data warehouse, right? It's, it's a concept. A data lake is a concept. And we've reached to the point talking about data lakes because in most cases, big data projects uh, were a failure. So, they gave a new terminology or a new definition around big data projects. They call them data lakes. So what they say is there is a whole ocean of, of data out there, 
and you're building a data lake, which is a subset of the data ocean that you have in there. It's a bit more streamlined. You have a space where you store all your data in an efficient and um, uh, performant and low cost uh, way. So it's, it's just a concept. A data lake for me could be a relational database, a staging area, if you ask me. It's a data lake. I've got a relational database and I'm putting in there all kinds of data. It's a limited functionality data lake because it doesn't support unstructured data, a database, a relational database. So usually, in the vast majority of the cases, a data lake is um, some sort of big data infrastructure with Hadoop file system with NoSQL databases where we just throw in their data. And this data, at a later stage, we cleanse, we process, we transform, and then we analyze. In essence, it's, it's a low-cost um, way of storing huge amounts of data. And why do I say it's a low cost? Because before Hadoop systems and before uh, big data and data lakes came into place, we used to have data warehouses, and we still have data warehouses. What is the problem or the challenge with data warehouses? First of all, they don't support unstructured data. And secondly, and even more important, is they are expensive. Okay, so the technologies used for data warehouses are expensive. The hardware, the software, and you know, scaling out. So in, in a data warehouse, we are very cautious in terms of how much data are we going to throw in, how much data are we going to store, where are we, are we going to store it? In storage, in, in, in cheap storage, in more expensive storage, which is faster, and so on and so forth. Whereas in data lakes, we just don't care. It's, it's commodity hardware. It follows the MPP approach, the massively parallel processing approach. So you have commodity cheap hardware scattered, scattered across. You store data in Hadoop file systems, NoSQL databases, and so on and so forth. And at any given point in time, you can access the data. So it's, it's low cost and it's really fast. And it can also support non-semi-structured um, uh, and unstructured data. So a data lake, again, for me, is just a repository, a data repository, low-cost data repository, where I just store data. That's it. I just throw data. If I'm going to use it or not, that's a different question. But I don't care about storing the data because it's not expensive. Okay. What Thank did you. Google say? Yeah. <laughs> Am I spot on? But again, it's it's a, it's a concept. It's a concept. There is, if you ask me, there is no right or wrong. As I said, a data warehouse for me could be a, just a staging area. I just throw data in there, in in a table format. I call it a data warehouse, although it does not follow the data warehousing principles. But I call it a data. It's it's a concept. It's not something rigid. There is the Compose for Data Lakes, which does a similar thing as Compose for Data Warehouses and automates the process of pushing data in data lakes. Now, the difference between data lakes and data warehouses is that data lakes do not, um, do not depend or do not use any RDBMS. A data warehouse is traditionally an RDBMS, a relational database. It could, it could be an MPP, like uh, Netiza, Exadata, Teradata, Exasol, and so on and so forth. But the basis is an RDBMS. It follows the principles of an RDBMS. So, so the difference between those two composes are like just the target is different? It's the target and some sort of functionality because on a data lake, um, in most cases, you use some sort of Hive Metastore. So you have Hive. So you need to build, build the Metastore of, of Hive, which is a different technology. Right? You have your Hadoop file system, you throw the data in there, your files, and then you have another layer, which is Hive, where you define your metadata based on your data set. And then on top of that, you can apply some uh, machine learning or AI stuff, which come along with the, uh, the data lake infrastructure. So a data lake could be Hadoop, could be MongoDB, could be Cassandra, could be whatever. Okay, just, just want to be sure, so mm -hmm. this feature composed 
for data warehouse is related to relational databases, typically RDBMS. DMS. Yes. The compose for data lakes, uh, basically no CQL uh, target yeah. databases. Yeah. That's the Hadoop, yeah. We will know 1st January. <laughs> because as Etunity was acquired quite, uh, quite recently, uh, so now there are still integration efforts uh, for, for the click as well. So uh, we even don't have it uh, in the official price list at the moment. We have uh, Click Data Catalyst, which we will show you after break. And this will be you know, what will be sending you the information right after we ha we have it so we will definitely know because we are really looking forward to that so we'll see thank you very much Makis. Thank, thank you very you. much for your questions as well uh, let's you. let's have a 10 minutes break if you will 10 10 minutes 15 minutes and and we'll rejoin here for for click data catalyst which is the catalog for business users So, welcome. My name is Yuri Mishina. Uh, first of all, apologies, I'm a bit cold, so uh, uh, occasionally I'll, I'll, I'll cough, but uh, I'll try to deliver uh, the presentation. Uh, just to uh, encourage you, uh, again, if you have any questions, post them on the Slido or just raise your hand and ask if, if you prefer. Uh, so, uh, I'll talk about uh, uh, another tool uh, provided by Click, Click Data Catalyst, uh, which uh, enables users to, or enables uh, uh, organizations to uh, catalog data from different data sources into a single uh, dashboard catalog where you can uh, search for the data set you need for your analysis, shop put it in, your, in a shopping cart and uh, uh, publish it or use it in your analysis uh, forwards. Uh, I'll uh, may try to make uh, the theory as short as possible, but we need to uh, mention a few points. Uh, and uh, so uh, I'll... I'll mm, I'll describe what is Click Data Catalyst uh, briefly. How can it help you to uh, get data from row to analysis ready? Uh, how to onboard data into Click Data Catalyst, uh, prepare and publish them. And uh, then uh, I'll do the more in interesting uh, thing and uh, do a short demonstration. Uh, just very briefly through this picture. Uh, um, probably this picture uh, is a well-known situation to you where you have uh, many, many different data sources uh, here on the left-hand side. Uh, different departments doing different stuff, using different, uh, different uh, tools. Uh, one department, department not knowing what's going on in the uh, other departments. and. Uh, it's uh, pretty hard to do a coherent analysis in this environment. So Click Data Catalyst uh, is a tool which helps you to organize all these data sources, create data sets, uh, curated, managed data sets, which are available, searchable, and if prepared correctly, reliable, uh, secure for use in reporting, in analytics, or in other subsequent business processes. So what are the most common obstacles to data availability? So you want to do a analysis for uh, your needs, uh, but uh, probably you don't know about a data source which is there for you to use because it's uh, handled by different department. Uh, <coughs> uh, sometimes you maybe have access to the data set, but it's uh, hard for you because it was prepared by somebody else. You don't know uh, uh, what methods were used 
uh, you don't know uh, what is the data lineage, so uh, what are other uh, like preceding steps needed to to create the data sets. So what are what are dependencies and what can break in the process? So it's hard to understand data quality. Uh, then a uh, typical scenario, different uh, departments use different tools. It's hard to share them. So uh, maybe uh, you will probably use Click, but maybe some of your colleagues use uh, Tableau or Power BI, and then it's hard to share uh, your findings. Uh, something which you do, like, uh, um, in a way, like I, I'll do this real quick. Just try to uh, try to see where I get with this analysis. Uh, that's something which is pretty raw, and it, and it doesn't mean uh, doesn't meet uh, standards which uh, you would need to meet if you want to publish this analysis uh, forward for your uh, organization. So uh, these are like the most uh, common things we see, and. Uh, Click Data Catalyst uh, helps you to, to organize things and uh, um, uh, streamline these processes, uh, uh, getting into, uh, uh, because it, it uh, gets into the center of your analytics or data, data delivery process. So again, you have your data sources on the left-hand side. Uh, you load or, or onboard data into Data Catalyst, where you uh, uh, enrich the data sets or the catalog which is created in there, uh, either by manually providing business metadata to those data sets. So you need to describe the data set, what is in the data set, how it was prepared, who is uh, the person responsible for, for uh, keeping the data set uh, healthy and up to date, etc. And you can do that manually directly in uh, Data Catalyst, or you can integrate with uh, different data uh, governance tools like Colibra or IGC and uh, pull data from there, import it into Click Data Catalyst. Uh, and uh, then uh, you can use, uh, or users can uh, shop for data sets and use them in business intelligence, data science, or load those data into data warehouse from which it can be again populated into Click Data Catalyst for cataloging purposes. And uh, this, this uh, rectangle here just mentions that uh, QDC runs on uh, uh, Hadoop or Linux. So uh, you have a like, modern platform, uh, underlying platform, which you can use. So how do, you <coughs> how do you get data from raw to ready? Uh, first of all, you need to onboard the data, so connect to the data source. Uh, we'll, uh, I will mention different data sources uh, uh, later on, and you can uh, uh, onboard the data in four, uh, in three, uh, three ways. So uh, probably, uh, may maybe you want to create an exact copy of the data from the source, so offload from the source. Uh, in that case, you will use the managed level of, uh, of uh, uh, connection, and this creates a, a, a copy of the data. It creates a statistical profile, so you know the distribution of values, you know minimum, maximum values, etc., etc. Some, some, some more uh, metrics, and uh, then uh, security rules are, are applied based on group memberships. So uh, data sources and data sets are assigned to a groups, to to a group, and users also are members of a group. So on, uh, a user can only see those data sets which are assigned to his or hers group. Uh, then again, for some, for some cases, in some cases, uh, you don't want to create a copy of data, but you need to know, uh, you need to get the statistical profile, so you need to know uh, value distribution and stuff. Uh, then you can uh, uh, use registered level of uh, onboarding. Uh, 
so this uh, will uh, like download a sample of data, create this statistical profile, but will not uh, create a physical copy from the source. And then the last level of, of uh, data management is uh, addressed. And this only like, lets you know that this data set exists, data set exists in exists in certain uh, source, but uh, we don't load data from there. There's, uh, uh, you get the technical met metadata, so, so you know uh, what tables, what fields are there, but uh, nothing else. But it helps you to, to uh, let your users know what data sets are available for use. So when you uh, uh, have the data, uh, then steps which I'll, uh, I already mentioned follow. You enrich the catalog, prepare data. Oh, I didn't mention the prepare data. Uh, prepare data is a module, a uh, simple ETL module for uh, uh, simple uh, data manipulation. So if you need, like, combine uh, tables coming from different sources into a single data set, you can do that with prepare. Or if you, can, if you need to perform a few joins, uh, then uh, prepare data uh, helps you with that. And in the last step, you publish the data sets for your users. OK, beginning from the end, uh, this is how the data catalog looks like. And I'll show more in the demo. So all these, uh, all these uh, Tiles are uh, individual entities or individual data sets. And you see a uh, data set name and uh, three uh, indicators describing the uh, quality of uh, the data set. So there's operational indicator, which says uh, uh, um, how successful are uh, refresh jobs. So if you refresh data on a daily basis and uh, a job fails from time to time, then this percentage goes down. So this helps you decide if you need 100% reliable analysis, then you probably will not rely on a data set which is not reliable. Uh, then quality indicator. This one says, uh, this one describes the quality of the data in the data set. So you can set up uh, different validation rules. And uh, based on these validation rules, data are described as good, completely bad, or ugly. And uh, if there are some ugly or bad results, uh, then a quality indicator goes down. So again, this helps you to decide uh, how reliable or how, how uh, uh, how good is the data source. And the last one being popularity, uh, this simply says how popular or how used is the data set. So this uh, helps uh, data stewards or data owners to decide uh, if the data set is not used, do we really need to maintain it or do we focus on a different data set instead. OK, uh, so when you onboard data, uh, what they, first, first of all, what data sources uh, uh, can Click Data Catalyst read? And uh, the answer is uh, many. Uh, I would maybe Marcus will uh, correct me. Can I say like everything? Given that there's the custom connector. <laughs> Vast majority, yes. So uh, typically, uh, database, uh, relational databases, that would be probably the most typical scenario, uh, those we can read. Then main mainframe data, file data from XML, JSON, CSVs, etc. And then there's a custom connector, which, will, which can be customized, uh, or based on which you can build a connection to uh, uh, other systems. During the data onboarding, so when I, when I connect to a source system uh, and I pick tables or files which I want to load, then uh, data are profiled, so a statistical profile is created. And there are a few uh, basic uh, metrics which are calculated. 
uh, and this can be also customized. So I have minimum values, maximum values, distribution, uh, frequency, etc. Also during this process, uh, technical metadata is downloaded. This means uh, like a schema description from the source system. So if I'm loading data from a SQL database, then uh, like uh, the, the create statement of the uh, SQL table is loaded. So what are, what are the fields, what are uh, data types of the fields? Uh, if I load data from an XML, there's probably a uh, um, XML uh, schema definition file, which will contain this technical metadata. Validation rules are applied and dirty data are quarantined, which means they are uh, physically separated from the good re records. And this helps you to uh, only work with either good data for your analysis or the bad data for the correction uh, mechanisms if you need to set up. And in the end, uh, the data, if you create a copy of the data, the data uh, land uh, on a Linux file system and you can publish to, uh, to uh, different sources uh, uh, at the end. And of course, security is applied. So uh, everything, sources, data sets, everything is assigned to a group. And uh, users also are assigned to a group so, so, security, uh, so that security is maintained. Uh, in the next step, when enriching the catalog, Uh, uh, Click Data Catalyst identifies and tags uh, sensitive data. So there are rules which help you uh, check for uh, sensitive data. Uh, there are quite a few predefined but can be customized so you can create your own uh, uh, rules. And this uh, uh, marks those records or th those fields which contain sensitive uh, information or sensitive uh, uh, data which needs to be either obfuscated or masked or deleted. Uh, so in this step, uh, you also uh, provide business description of the data set. So when you load data from a database, you get the table name, you get the field names, but uh, in many systems or in many data databases, uh, the field names are, let's call it, encoded. So you kind of can guess what it means, but you, you cannot be really sure. Uh, so in order to enable your users to work with the data set, you need to describe those fields and those tables. What's in there? Was there any transformation? How to um, work with the data set if you want to achieve something. So this is the uh, business metadata which need to be either provided uh, manually in, in Click Data Catalyst or if you have a data governance tool then you can integrate with the uh, Click Data Catalyst. Uh, this metadata is uh, stored in a PostgreSQL database so you can uh, work with that uh, outside uh, QDC if you need. And uh, two more important steps uh, which happen in this uh, in, in, uh, while enriching catalog. Uh, oops, let's go back here. Uh, cross file relationships. So uh, if you load a table, uh, QDC tries to identify uh, those tables which uh, are somehow uh, connected to the table which you are loading. So if there's a relationship. Probably you, if you are, uh, if you want to uh, do analysis analysis of, let's say orders, you will also need to load table of products or customers or another uh, associated table. And one of key functionalities is. Uh, ability to comment on data and so so you can like crowdsource the creation of metadata 
Uh, if I, as a user, I'm unsure and I don't really understand what the table is about, I can ask the, the data owner in a comment and the data owner answers, etc., etc. And this uh, also is searchable so other users can learn from that as well. Uh, the prepare module, uh, uh, I'll show more in the demo, but uh, it helps you to, as I said, unify multiple tables into a so single uh, data set, uh, create custom fields, uh, do a few uh, transformations. It's a drag and drop simple tool where you load your uh, source tables uh, do there's a transformation which happens and a join of these two tables and there's output table which is then published to catalog and uh, the last step publish and shop so you will see uh, the catalog is basically a marketplace uh, like a IKEA catalog you know you open it you go through pages and then you pick what you like and uh, use it. Uh, so this is really designed for self-service, so to say, shopping for data. Uh, based on the identified relationships between data sets, you get recommendations for related data sets. And uh, for, uh, when you shop for data, you can schedule the publication so let's say I want to use this data set and I want to lend it uh, in uh, my database on a daily basis. I can set up a job which will daily load data from QDC. And there's a single click integration with ClickSense. There's also single click integration with Tableau already. And I know that Power BI is, is uh, integration with Power BI is uh, uh, on the roadmap for next releases, so it will come soon as well. Last but not least, uh, QDC comes with a, a large set of APIs, so you can integrate QDC with other tools seamlessly uh, and um, customize many, many of the processes or uh, move, out, move the processes outside of QDC environment if uh, you need to do so. Okay, and now's the time for the demonstration. Are we there? Yes, we are. How come? <clears throat> okay. So this is the environment uh, of Click Data Catalyst. So it's uh, accessible through a web browser. And uh, here on the left-hand side, I have uh, these different modules. So source module for connecting new uh, data sources, uh, discover module for uh, providing uh, the metadata, for working with the metadata, prepare module where I do create those data flows and, and uh, transform data, uh, <coughs> Publish module contains published data sets, so, so uh, publish module contains published jobs, so the data sets which are frequently uh, moved or published to different to, to other targets. Uh, security, of course, and the most important, uh, the catalog. So as I said, uh, these are all the data sets which are here. And this, since this is a demo environment, there are quite many, more than almost 400 uh, data sets. But uh, uh, it's pretty easy to navigate in this uh, because uh, 
you can search. And uh, I made a good custom of prefixing all my data sets with my name. So I can search for whatever uh, starts with my name and uh, I'll get a, get a quick uh, result. Or I can search for whatever is uh, connected to sales. And it uh, searches for the source name, uh, data set name, and it also searches in uh, metadata. So for example, yesterday we did something with uh, names. Oops. Full name. And so I searched for full name, and there's no data set which is called full name, but when I open, when I hover over the data set name, uh, the business metadata appears in a pop-up, and the description contains uh, those words which I was looking for. So uh, uh, providing a good description helps the users to, to find uh, what they're looking for. Okay, so... Uh, this is like uh, the end, but let's see how to get to this end. So first of all, we need to connect to a data source. Uh, I have already uh, the, the connections to the source systems are al already there, so I don't uh, need to set up a connection, but I can uh, decide what uh, tables I will load from my data source. So I will add data. Uh, let's say I will create a new source. I will pick a connection from uh, the list of connections. Here I, I need to decide on the level of uh, how I will work with data. So, so those uh, three levels, managed, uh, registered and addressed, uh, I like pre-select the default value for this data source in here. So uh, I can then customize per, per table, but uh, uh, at this step I set the default value and I decide if I want to copy the data or I am okay with just a sample of data. So I'll choose uh, the managed level, which will copy the data. I must choose a group for security reasons. And the source hierarchy, which I'll take default. Okay, so this now loads. Uh, this is a um, SQL database. Uh, and uh, now it looked into the database, and there are four schemas. So I'll pick which, sch which schema I want to load. And then there are tables from this schema, and I'll I will not select all, I will select a few of them. So I'll select, uh, let's say, country, uh, customer, payments, stuff, and uh, let's say that's about it. Okay, I need to provide a unique name for my source. Ah, oh, here's the name. Uh, okay, so there are my, my four tables. I describe uh, technically how the source looks like. <coughs> and click on save. So these are the four tables which, I'm, uh, which I will now load from uh, the data source. I can load either individually or I can uh, shift select all tables and load all at once. <coughs> uh, since this is a new data source, I can, uh, this, uh, I can only choose uh, here uh, that it's a new load, but uh, in subsequent uh, loads uh, I can choose if uh, this will append 
to my previous loads, so there's a, some sort of differentiate uh, difference load, or I can overwrite my, my data completely. Okay. So this is now running, and let's see for customers I can view the load lock. So what's it, what is going on? Uh, I can already see that there are uh, uh, 599 good records. Uh, that's because I didn't set up any validation rules, so all records are good, of course. But if there there were some validation rules. <coughs> I will already see that there were some bad or ugly records. I see load properties, so the complete setup and definition of the load. So uh, uh, you can preset, you can set the different uh, presets, uh, validation rules, um, data delimiters, um, tagging rules, etc. Uh, where is the data source where uh, the data should land uh, in the load properties. And this comes to, to a field level. So, so uh, for example, the validation rules are set on the field level. So, how does it look like? This is done. Okay. <coughs> so I have loaded data from, from these four uh, entities. I can see how, much, how many records are there and uh, how many records were good, bad, or ugly. Now I can switch to the discover module, search for my newly loaded data, see which entities are there, and uh, in here I can provide the most critical thing, the business description for the end user. So uh, I, I selected my payment table, I will give it a very clear name, payment table, and uh, provide description uh, or information to the user that this table only contains IDs. To work with it, you need to join dimensions. And I can again check on the properties, uh, add different properties. There are like uh, many predefined, uh, which help you to, uh, for example, flag uh, private information, etc. Okay. Uh, now when I switch to catalog, I can already search for that data set, although it's a bit raw. So when I search for payment table, It's there, the table called payment fact from my newly created source. Quality 100% because no validation rules, so no bad records. Uh, operational uh, indicator 50% for the starters. Uh, uh, this will of course change with subsequent loads and uh, not used at all yet. Okay, so this is the, the discover module is uh, the place where data stewards or data owners will spend the most time providing this uh, business description. And this can be, uh, by the way, imported. So, uh, so uh, you don't need to type it in for each and uh, every uh, table or each and every uh, field. Yes, 
Yes, it's uh, the architecture of QDC is pretty open, so you can uh, uh, using the APIs you can you can like uh, import them from outside source, and uh, the rules engine is uh, one of the standard open source engines, so uh, that can be reused as well. Yeah. So when you are doing a load from source, you can you you, you will timestamp it. Mm -hmm. So you can do like different roads, uh, different loads, but until you overwrite one of those, you will have versions, and the load logs store uh, also all the setup, the whole setup of the load. So even different validation rules and sets and, and properties which were set during that load. So if you have a, a different results for different loads, you can you can uh, um, track what changed and what caused the difference. So maybe there was a change to validation rule or something. Okay. Now we'll move to the prepare module, and uh, I'll try to show you a simple transformation. So uh, we learned. We we learned. Uh, yes, we learned in the catalog that uh, when uh, we want to work with the payment table, it contains only IDs. To work with it, you need to join dimensions. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, I'll go to prepare module, start the designer. And uh, I'll add source. Source is my newly created source, number three. And uh, I'll use uh, payment, customer, and staff table. Uh, I can decide. Uh, if I want to use all data or maybe the latest load or a sample or maybe I want to use only bad records because I need to set up some correction uh, measure. Uh, so I need to see those bad records and uh, analyze them to set up the correction measure. Okay, so in the payment table there are really only IDs and the amount of the payment. Uh, let's say I want uh, to be able to analyze payments by customer and uh, employee. So I'll need to do a few things. First of all, the staff uh, table and customer table contain first name and last name as separate columns. I want single full name column. So I'll create a transformation starting with uh, staff, for example. Uh, I will only need two fields, one of them being uh, staff ID. And I'll create a new field, which will be uh, empl uh, employee full name. And uh, in the expression builder, I can use different functions to, to uh, calculate or create my new field. So I'll need uh, first name and last name as a source field, as source fields, and I use a well-known concat function to join these two fields, and I also need to uh, provide a space between first and last name. So this will combine first and last name into a single uh, field. I'll hit on validate. Yeah, it seems okay. Hopefully it will work. So as an output of this transformation, I will only have uh, two fields, ID of the employee and full name of the employee. And uh, now I can join this to the payment fact table. I will simply 
define joint criteria. So this is a key on which I want to perform the join. It's stuff ID because it's in both tables. And the uh, output is uh, predefined for me. So uh, I can, again, uh, leave out some fields if I don't want to load all, but uh, this is what the output will look like. Uh, okay, that's it for employees. And I'll do this very same transformation for the customer dimension. So I only want full name of the customer. So I need to get uh, customer ID and customer full name, which will be again a uh, combination of first name, space, and last name. Is this okay? Yes, it's okay. Okay, I'll move it over here and create another join well, I'll, where I will join this with my payments table. Again, simple join criteria, this time on the customer ID. And that's about it. Okay. As a very last step, I need to add target, so where I want to publish the resulting table. Uh, this will be part of my uh, data source. It will be part of the very same groups. And target name will be transformed payments table. <clears throat> okay, and I'll simply end this flow in this target. So uh, this will create the table for me. Again, oh, first of all, save. Payments uh, table transformation. I can provide a description. I will not for the time sakes now. Okay. Data flow saved. Uh, validate, given the experience from yesterday. Validate it successfully. Wow. And execute. <coughs> uh, Again, I can select a load date, so this will be the timestamp on my load. And I can also define parameters. So, for example, if I want uh, to do a calculation based on some uh, outside parameter, I can create a parameter here and then uh, uh, define it from the outside, maybe via APIs. Okay, uh, this will take some time. A uh, couple minutes, maybe. So in the end, uh, the table will appear in my catalog. And uh, also in the discover module. So maybe uh, I can, uh, um, maybe I want to uh, provide some description first. Uh, okay, payments uh, table transformed. Uh, this table contains full name of customer and em oh, employee. Save and close. Now I can go to the catalog and search for full name. And there's my table. Uh, 
uh, in here, uh, you already noticed that when I hover over the uh, table name, the metadata or the description appears. Uh, I can put that data set in the shopping cart from here, but uh, before I do that, I want to uh, analyze it further. So I want to see what's in there. No data available yet because uh, uh, the transformation job is not finished yet. So maybe, maybe let's uh, pick a different table uh, first. Uh, I'll, I'll show the one from, from the other demo because it's done already. Uh, and it calculates, uh, okay, uh, I can see the list of fields. I can uh, look at the, oh, how come? How come? Uh, let's pick uh, something else then. Okay, so I can look at the list of fields and I can uh, see uh, field distribution. So uh, how many occurrences of a certain value are there? What's uh, minimum and maximum value? Uh, how many records are empty, etc. Uh, there are no specific properties, so no data for that. And uh, uh, related entities would display those tables which relate to uh, other tables which relate to the one which I'm currently looking at. I can also uh, see sample data. So this is what the data look like. Export if I, if I uh, need. And view lineage. So this is a basically a source table. But I can see that uh, it's loaded from a source. Uh, and uh, there's some data flow using this table. So something depends on the table which I'm looking at right now. Uh, same for my new, newly created uh, table. I will be able to see what is the source, what are different tables coming to the data flow and uh, resulting in the data set which I created. Okay, so I'm happy with this transformation now. I can add this to my cart and from the cart I can uh, um, add maybe add a few more data sets if I need to and I can publish it. So this uh, will uh, create a published job and I will decide what is the target system for my data set. So that can be uh, Hadoop S3 or a uh, database if I need to publish it to database or I can uh, publish directly to click. And it works on the first time which didn't happen yesterday. So this will load data to the click uh, sense directly and create an application for me. And since I am a lazy click developer, I will let click analyze the data and create a few charts for me. And maybe I am happy with this one and uh, this one. This looks nice. And I'll create one more, uh, which will be a bar chart containing customer name and total amount. So that's it. Do we have any questions? Uh, 
it's the uh, catalyst itself. Yes, yes. Uh, I would provide the information in the description. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can maybe check if there are some questions uh, in Slido. There were some questions. I think Julius, you, you had one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the question is about masking when defining the data set and uh, putting the rule. Uh, when exactly and where exactly data will be masked? So the data will be masked at the publish action. So in uh, catalyst you will see you will be able to see the data but when you publish uh, it will be masked and in is there any interim storage where there is another copy with uh, these uh, unmasked data available no no so only the source and only the published content exactly okay thank you and you can decide uh, there are a few methods how you uh, can uh, mask the data. So it, it can be masked or it can be uh, like cleared or turned to zero. And uh, masking, some different masking uh, methods are there. Are some different masking methods. OK, another question. Can loads of data be driven by triggers? such as if data exists, then load data. Oh, I think so, yes. Uh, there is a, um, so the, the, the uh, scheduler in here is a rather simple scheduler, but uh, what it can do, for example, is uh, it can look in a folder if uh, whether or not there is a file which exists. So if a file appears in a folder, then it can trigger a job. So you can uh, set your previous steps to create a file somewhere uh, when they are done, and then uh, Catalyst can fire up subsequent transformations. Instead of making joins visually, can we edit the SQL code directly? Oh, let's see. <laughs> I wouldn't say this is SQL. But what you can do here is you can view the whole script. So the whole transformation is uh, basically scripted. And uh, yeah, there is join. And uh, I'm not sure if uh, this is not editable. But no, this only uh, changes the name. So uh, I'm afraid no, this is only visual. Or uh, of course you can, if, if, you, if you will work with Catalyst via uh, APIs, of course then you, you can do it uh, via APIs. Okay, I think that's good. Are there any questions from uh, from the auditorium? Additional ones to those we discussed.
So you can apply uh, validation rules. But that's okay if you don't have a list of rules created or anything. There, there are uh, like predefined rules which come with uh, with uh, data catalyst, but you can you can define your own. Yes. Let's see if we can uh, if we can uh, uh. okay, so enable validation and I can uh, Where's the stuff? Okay, so we can uh, uh, define simple validations using uh, like regular expressions, and then there are uh, other uh, like more complex uh, rules which can be defined as well. So this. I don't know answer to the question, but I, I would assume you can import. Good. <laughs> so <laughs> not skip it like okay. No, I think we, we have seen a beautiful <coughs> stuff today. So I hope you you enjoy it. Thank you very much for your kind visit. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much that uh, we can share with you uh, what what is new. We we plan if if you are happy with that, we would like to continue with kind of these sessions. You know, whenever we have something really interesting and, and new uh, coming either from from Click or from our, our internal resources, we'll try to deliver uh, as as such. Thank you very much again, and uh, see you next time. Then, thank you. Bye bye.